Hello, uh, my name is Jim Turk and I'm the director of the Center for Free Expression at Ryerson University. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land in which I'm speaking to you today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Uh, I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. On behalf of the Center for Free Expression at Ryerson University and the co-sponsors of today's event, which are the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, the Edmonton Public Library, the Milton Public Library, Penn Canada, the Ryerson Journalism Research Center, the Thunder Bay Public Library, the Toronto Public Library, and the Vancouver Public Library, I want to welcome you to the Center for Free Expression's virtual forum series panel on ag-gag laws and the public's right to know. As you may know, Alberta and Ontario, and now others as you will hear, have introduced ag-gag laws that seek to prevent whistleblowers, undercover journalists, and animal advocates from reporting on animal treatment, public health threats, and unsafe working conditions and environmental offenses at farms and slaughterhouses. We're gonna be looking at what do these laws mean for press freedom, the public's right to know, and democratic freedoms more generally in Canada. We have quite an outstanding panel to talk about these issues, and I'd like to introduce them now. The first panelist is Robert Cribb. Rob is an award-winning investigative journalist at the Toronto Star. He has received national reporting awards and citations for investigations into offshore tax evasion, child exploitation, human trafficking, dangerous doctors, and public health threats. Rob is the past president of the Canadian Association of Journalists, the first international board member of the global organization, Investigative Reporters and Editors, is currently president of the Canadian journalism charity Veritas, Advancing Journalism in the Public Interest. He is also co-author of Digging Deeper, a Canadian reporter's uh, research guide. Rob teaches investigative reporting at Ryerson's uh, University School of Journalism and also at the University of Toronto. Welcome, Rob. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Our second panelist is Jody Lazar. Jody is an assistant professor at the Shulock School of Law at Dalhousie University in Halifax, where she teaches and researches in constitutional law, animal law, and family law. Prior to her appointment, she completed graduate studies in law at McGill, as well as a, a clerkship for the Honorable Justice Michael Moldover at the Supreme Court of Canada. She is currently undertaking a shirk funded research project entitled Prohibited Advocacy, Farm Trespass Laws, Civil Disobedience, and the Constitution, in which she is examining the constitutional dimensions of animal rights activism and the restrictions on that activism. Welcome, Jody. Thank you. Our third panelist is Richard Moon. Dick is Distinguished University Professor and Professor of Law at the University of Windsor. His research focuses on freedom of expression and freedom of conscience and religion. He has written a number of very important books on freedom of expression, including Putting Faith in Hate When Religion is the Source or Target of Hate Speech, Freedom of Conscience and Religion, The Constitutional Protection of Freedom of Expression. And he wrote a, a decisive report. It was called the Report to the Canadian Human Rights Commission concerning Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act and the regulation of hate speech on the internet. Dick is the recipient of both the law school and university-wide teaching awards and has served as president of the Canadian Law and Society Association. Welcome, Dick. Thanks, Jim. And our moderator for this remarkable panel is quite uh, remarkable herself. Uh, it's Kara Zwiebel. Kara is the acting general counsel of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. She has been with the CCLA and other roles since 2010. And prior to that, practiced commercial litigation public law and health law in a national law firm. After, her, after completing her Bachelor of Laws at Osgoode Hall Law School, Cara, Cara, um, Cara articled as a law clerk 
to the Honorable Justice Ian Binney at the Supreme Court of Canada before being called to the Ontario Bar in 2005. Kara received her Master of Laws degree from New York University as an Arthur T. Vanderbilt scholar. Welcome, Kara. Our, our format for today's event uh, will be that the panel will have a conversation about ag-gag issues for about 45 to 55 minutes. And then we'll turn to questions and answers uh, from the audience or questions uh, or comments that you might have. Uh, for the audience, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. And if you could, uh, if you have any questions that come to mind as you're listening to the conversation that you would like to ask to one or more of the panelists, please just at that time, note it down, click on the Q&A button and write down your question. You can do that anytime during the event. Uh, and I'd encourage you to do it while you're thinking of the question rather than saving up for the uh, period when we formally turn to the audience. Um, the uh, uh, chat button, chat function doesn't uh, work in this version of, of, uh, of the Zoom webinar. So just use the Q&A uh, to uh, write down any questions you might have. That's it for me. Uh, and now over to the panel and Kara. Thanks, Jim, and uh, thank you to the Center for Free Expression at Ryerson for, for hosting this event and to our, our panelists for coming to discuss this important topic. Um, uh, oh, I should just say um, there was a small error in the bio. I am not the acting general counsel of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. I am a program director there. Um, I do have a boss, so, um, so I, I wanted that to be, to be clear before we started. Um, we're going to start today, I think, with uh, with Jody, who's going to sort of set, set the stage for our discussion. Um, so Jody, can you tell us what an ag-gag law is, uh, what it does, and where in Canada these laws are in place or are being contemplated? Uh, yeah, certainly. It's a good um, first question. So um, Ag-gag is uh, a term coined by the New York Times about a decade ago, short for agricultural gag. So ag-gag or agricultural gag laws. And, you know, as we heard from Jim in the introduction, basically what they do in short is um, suppress the ability of animal rights activists or advocates, uh, employee whistleblowers, undercover journalists, um, whoever really, to document and expose um, serious cruelty uh, toward farmed animals on industrial farms um, and in the food production system. And they do that by um, making it illegal, subject in some cases to extremely severe penalties to gain entry onto farms or slaughterhouses, and in some cases to be near transport vehicles um, in order to uh, gather and uh, gather information, documentation, evidence of abuse um, and disseminate that, uh, that information. Um, in Canada, uh, so these laws started in the US and, and I'm happy to speak more about that later, but um, in Canada, they also, as I mentioned, deal with transport. Um, so they prohibit people from interfering with a vehicle uh, transporting farmed animals, typically from the farm to the slaughterhouse. Um, and they also uh, prohibit individuals from interacting with um, animals um, on those trucks. Um, they are aimed at, um, purportedly aimed at, uh, ensuring the safety of farmers and animals and food security. Um, they're, they seem like a response to um, what I think is an increase in um, activities by animal rights ad, uh, activists um, of entering farms, um, documenting what they see, streaming the footage on social media, you know, in order to, again, sort of reveal the truth about what happens um, on farms. Um, and also in response to um, activities of members of groups like what's called the SAVE movement who um, bear witness to animals in transport. Again, they, they film their activities, they, they stand on public streets outside of slaughterhouses um, and interact with the animals uh, on their way to slaughter. Um, they give them water on hot days, they, they pet them um, uh, and 
and and the laws, of course, with, with respect to the transport provisions, they they aim to prevent activists from from doing that. Again, the purpose of that is to bear witness and to to share um, the information um, about uh, what industrial farming looks like, about what transport looks like in Canada. Um, I can talk about this later as well, but transport laws with respect to agricultural animals in Canada are are extremely they're completely inadequate. Um, so what they actually do, of course, which you know I should be clear at this point, is that they restrict freedom of expression. Um, they prevent the collection of and the dissemination of information on a subject of public importance, um, how animals are treated on farms in transport at slaughter, and um, and uh, and in the food system generally. And that's information you know, that I think uh, the public has a right to know whether you're an, an animal, you know, sympathizer or animal rights activist or vegetarian or, or meat lover. Everyone wants to know that the animals that they're eating have been treated, you know, humanely. Um, so, uh, you know, stifling this kind of expression prevents um, people from uh, revealing that that's often not the case. Um, where are they? Uh, Alberta and Ontario have adopted some form of ag -ag legislation. Um, theirs are, um, I think, the the worst, um, <laughs> where the constitution is uh, is is um, concerning involved um, uh, concerned um, because they, in in addition to creating really steep penalties for a trespass um, in Alberta, that includes possible imprisonment. They also um, uh, deem entry on false pretenses to be trespassing. So an individual who uh, lies um, uh, about their real purpose for being there. So somebody who get, uh, gets a job, um, but is actually there uh, with the intention of blowing the whistle um, or an undercover journalist or, or again, whoever, if someone misrepresents who they are, and in order to gain access to the farm, in order to collect footage and disseminate that footage, which is a, a general practice of, again, undercover journalists and animal advocates, um, then they are deemed trespass, deemed to have trespassed and subject to you know, extremely severe penalties in, uh, in Alberta, up to um, $30,000 for a second offense and uh, jail time. Um, in Ontario, uh, up to $25,000 um, or $10,000. 15 for, for a first offense for an individual. Um, so those bills uh, exist in yeah, Alberta and Ontario. Uh, PEI has a form of ag, -AG legislation passed very quickly with little attention. Um, that doesn't include uh, a false pretenses provision. So it's not quite as problematic from a, a freedom of expression um, perspective. Uh, but uh, it does um, prohibit unlawful entry into a place where uh, an animal might be exposed to a disease or, or toxic substance. So um, same thing, same targets, very high penalties as well and possible uh, possible jail. There's actually a minimum uh, minimum penalty in, in PEI, which is, uh, which is interesting and, and problematic. And um, Manitoba uh, tabled their ag, -AG legislation yesterday. Um, it doesn't contain a false pretenses provision, but it does uh, explicitly uh, prohibit uh, interacting with animals in, in transit. And uh, a similar bill is also uh, heading to committee for second reading um, or, or study after second reading uh, federally, um, which does similar uh, similar things as well. So it's a growing trend. Um, it's bad for animals. <laughs> it's bad for freedom of expression and I, it's bad for the public's right to, uh, to important information. Thanks, Jody. That um, I think that helps us sort of guide the the discussion. So, I mean, to your last point about about freedom of expression, maybe um, Dick, can you talk to us about sort of what you see as the larger implications of these laws in terms of of the charter's protection of freedom of expression? Yeah, sure. Uh, just following up on what Jody had to say, I mean, I think there's a very strong case to be made that these laws, at least in their typical form, could be understood as breaching the charter and the freedom of expression provision. Uh, in particular, but it's not a straightforward claim. It's not the kind of standard free speech claim. It's a little more complicated than that. So the law is presented, presents itself as a restriction on access to farm property, a kind of trespass law, or as concerned with protecting safety or the safety of animals and so forth. And the charter itself doesn't give a right of access 
to uh, privately owned property in any way for a whole range of different reasons. And so really, the, well, one has to begin with a recognition that a private property owner does not have a duty to allow someone to enter onto their property under the charter. I mean, obviously legislation can enable a variety of things, but under the charter itself. But it does seem plain that the purpose of this law is to prevent the sharing uh, of information about what's going on on farm properties of different kinds. So if you think about one of the key provisions, which Jody described, the false pretenses, obtaining a consent to enter onto a property on the basis of false pretenses. Well, what's the object there? What's the, what's the harm that this is meant to address in some way? The harm of deceit when someone applies for a job? I don't think so. Um, it's certainly much more targeted than that. Is it to prevent harm that might occur on the property to animals? Well, again, that seems not at all to be what this law is directed at, even if it occasionally makes the formal claim that that's its concern. So ultimately, it seems that the harm is the information that might get out about what's going on in the farm property. So well, we come at it in a very indirect way, it seems that the underlying motive, the purpose, and ultimately the potential effect of this law is to inhibit uh, the availability of information about what's occurring in these properties. Now, if you look at the Ontario regulations, they have an exception for you know, uh, journalists of some sort or for whistleblowers. And so the extent to which this is a restriction on freedom of expression will depend on the scope of those exceptions. And I won't explore those now because I think those are things we can talk about as, as a group. Now, the other issue, which again, I think I can put aside for now, Jody raised, and that is the, the space for demonstration or protest uh, of some kind. And again, the language of the restriction um, concerning transportation, for example, it talks about obstruction, but it also talks about hindrance. And so that's potentially a very um, elastic uh, concept. And so there are real issues about free speech and protest within that context. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks, Dick. So, I mean, Jody mentioned this uh, in her comments and, and Jim did it in the intro. So um, the fact that these laws uh, affect what journalists can do. So Rob, can you talk to us as an investigative journalist about the concerns that you have about these laws and how they might impact your work and, and the work that your colleagues do? Yeah, sure. So I, like many investigative reporters, engage in undercover from time to time. It's not a daily exercise, but uh, for certain stories where we can make a case to our bosses and senior editors that there's simply no other way to get at it, that it is of sufficient public interest to warrant an extraordinary technique like this. Um, we do it. Uh, I've done it a number of times over my career. And I just need to make a point here that, that this is not uh, undertaken easily. You don't wake up in the morning and say, I think I'll go undercover today. There's a rigorous process of approval you have to make a very formal case. You have to show that there's no other way to get the story, that it matters sufficiently to use sort of a blunt object like this. Um, but in those cases, uh, it's certainly been my experience that it is a tool that can, under, uh, that, that can uncover information of vital public interest in a way that nothing else can. And so I've, in a couple, two or three cases, uh, I've done animal-based uh, undercover investigations. Uh, one of them was um, posing as a buyer at a uh, horse auction in the United States where they sell off essentially old uh, elderly horses who are filled with uh, various drugs for slaughter. And so we, we posed. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really have to misrepresent myself explicitly. I was simply there. I knew where it was, when it was. I showed up. Uh, but the inference was I was there to buy horses and I was looking at them and we toured the, the uh, horses the day before the auction, showed up. And then uh, we were identifying a particular uh, company that was transporting these horses to a slaughterhouse in Quebec. So we, um, after the auction was over, we identified the, the truck, the, the trailer truck 
and then for the period of two days followed that vehicle um, to Quebec, to the doors of the slaughterhouse facility and did, did that story. There was another story involving illegal slaughterhouses in the Toronto area. And we absolutely went undercover that we absolutely um, did not identify ourselves as journalists. And those stories I think had, uh, or it was justified. It's my opinion that those stories were justified. They raised issues, not just of, of animal treatment, but there's, keep in mind, there's, there's two issues in these kinds of stories. There's the treatment of the animals for sure, but then there's also the issue of um, the food supply, the impact on the food supply in both these stories. So they're not niche necessarily. Uh, they're, they're not targeted necessarily to animal rights advocates or, or those uh, concerned about the treatment of animals. This is ultimately, these are often food supply stories that speak to the safety of the food that we're all eating. Um, and so, you know, there, there is, I think, in, from, from the journalistic perspective, there is no question that a curtailing of those rights to, to do those kinds of stories ultimately undermine the public interest. It's certainly my view. I've been reading uh, both the Alberta and Ontario pieces of legislation. And, and certainly, I mean, when I look at the Ontario Act, um, there is certainly a case to be made based upon one, how one interprets the words of the law there's a case to be made that I, that I, if I were to do either of those two stories today, that they would be in breach of this, in the sense that there's some sweeping language um, that, that, for example, um, this notion that, that a journalist, even, even in the Ontario case where there is a carve out for journalists, it nevertheless says that we can, we can cause no harm to an individual in the process of doing this work. What on earth could that mean? I mean, there's no question that the stories that I did and that my colleagues do on this may in fact ca cause psychological harm. Somebody might get disciplined. Somebody could lose their job. Somebody might be charged, who knows? I mean, the truck, the truck driver that we followed for two days might well have had um, um, anxiety and concern about uh, us doing what we did. Um, so to me, I, I mean, because it's all new and, and there's, no, there's been no real testing of this, it's very, it, it's hard to know what the implications are, but the car about itself for journalists is, is, is curious to me. Like I, I, it's, it's always a, a slippery prospect trying to define what a journalist is. So what, what does that mean? Clearly I would fall under that category. There's no question. I'm a staff reporter at, at the Toronto Star, but we also know that there's a wide range of people who call themselves journalists. There's animal rights activists, for example, who uh, write freelance articles for uh, magazines or animal rights publications or websites. How might, how might the government or the courts interpret that person uh, as to whether he or she is or is not a journalist. The, the, the law talks about, uses this phrase, they must be um, conducting um, this work, quote, for valid journalistic purposes. But there's no real definition of what valid journalistic purposes means. And, and my definition of what a valid journalistic purpose might be and a judge's uh, interpretation of what that means may be two different things. And so all of this, I think collectively speaks to tremendous unease um, in the sense that it is trying to define something that can be very difficult to define. And then ultimately the mere act of trying to define it um, challenges this notion of to be in the charter and, and free speech. And then ultimately it really raises concerns about whether or not um, we're able to do this kind of work at, with, with, with tremendous financial potential threats of penalty. I mean, like, I can't afford this. There's no way. Uh, and certainly uh, freelance journalists could never afford to pay fines of this nature. And so does it have a detrimental chilling effect on aggressive journalism that seeks to tell the truth in the public interest? And then just very quickly, the wider concern for me, well beyond animal rights is that well, clearly based on what Jody just said, there's this incredible trend towards legislation that seeks to curtail this kind of work in this particular industry, which has been clearly very successful in seeking out these legislative protections. But what does this mean more broadly? If an industry can, 
can get this kind of legal protections from probing uh, journalists and activists, I mean, why would there be any number of industries in this country that would love to have the same kinds of protections from, from uh, the kind of accountability that comes from this work? So, so if this is allowed to stand unchallenged, I, I guess I wonder more broadly, what does this mean for undercover reporting, generally speaking, for any number of industries where journalists have no other option because of the secrecy or because of the lack of transparency, because documents don't exist, because freedom of information is not an option. Um, what does it mean for this kind of work that ultimately is so valuable to the collective public interest? Much of what we know about how we are governed and acted upon by governments and corporations are the result of this kind of uh, aggressive investigative journalism. And is this really in service of the public interest? Thanks, Rob. I want to, there's a couple of themes in there that I want us to talk about. Maybe the first one we could talk about has to do with these exceptions for uh, journalists and whistleblowers and um, Dick and Jody, maybe um, if either one of you want to sort of comment on um, the, the adequacy of those exceptions. I, I, I gather that um, I don't think there are those exceptions written into the Alberta um, legislation, but the Ontario legislation has regulations that that carve out some of these activities. Rob has talked about one of the inadequacies is the fact that, you know, um, any type of harm kind of disentitles you from relying on it. Um, can, can you talk more generally about those exceptions? Uh, sure, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I think Rob has said, you know, what, what there is to say about the journalism one, um, an expose exposing, you know, whether it's um, animal cruelty or any kind of, you know, misconduct or anything that, you know, the public would be upset about the uh, impacts of that on the individual employee are going to be serious. Um, there is, you know, literature documenting the stigma and um, just psychological stress that goes along with being outed, so to speak, for uh, in, for carrying out animal cruelty when really you're just engaging in the regular practices of farming and doing what you've been told to do. But employers will, you know, make an example out of out of um, out of employees, and that you know, the just recently read a story about an individual who couldn't work for two years. Um, and was, you know, just defamed, basically. Uh, so that's certainly psychological harm um, caused by, you know, reporting, let's say. Um, the other one is also problematic for whistleblowers, uh, so-called whistleblowers in, in the legislation. Um, you can be exempt from being charged with trespass if you are an employee whistleblower, uh, provided uh, that you... Um, a, document some kind of harm to an animal or an individual or property. And so if you don't document harm, then you are trespassing. Um, and more problematically, uh, if, you, if you do document that, that kind of information, you have to turn it over to the authorities, the police or whatever um, government body is responsible for animal welfare on farms or what have you, um, as soon as practicable, like right away. Um, and that's called a quick report law. Those exist in the US um, to the same end. And um, on the surface, they look great. Good, you're documenting animal cruelty, turn it over to the authorities and we will deal with that bad apple immediately, you know, fire that person who's going to suffer <laughs> distress or psychological or, you know, stress because of it. Um, but actually what that does is it prevents um, journalists or whistleblowers, undercover investigators, what have you, from documenting uh, repeated uh, systemic patterns of abuse that happen on farms um, every day, you know, regular industry practice like uh, castrating piglets without anesthetic, which is actually contrary to the industry codes of practice, um, but it's done every day uh, on farms. Um, so uh, the whistleblower exception is, um, is problematic for that reason. It, it, it undermines the entire reason of going undercover on a farm um, to begin with. Thanks. Was there something you wanted to 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on that. I mean, yes, I mean, I agree substantially with what's been said. I mean, there are, as we pointed out, the two exceptions for journalists and for whistleblowers, and they have basically the same uh, requirements to fall within the scope of them. Obviously, the journalism one focuses on journalists, and as Rob pointed out, well, there's a whole question about who exactly falls within that category. But the first thing is, and let me see, I, I won't read the exact language, but implying that you are qualified to do the relevant work. Well, you, you're not allowed to do that. Well, who in the world is gonna be hired? Or let me put it this way, simply applying for a job by its very nature, you are implying that you are qualified to do the work. And let me add, I don't even know what that means when we're talking about an, unregula an unregulated profession, if that's the right word to use. What, what are the qualifications for working on a farm exactly? It seems a completely open-ended uh, idea there. Uh, Rob pointed to the question of, and if your activity does harm in some way. Well, quite right, harm is an empty vessel. We can pour whatever we want into that. It is whatever we think is a bad or negative thing. One hopes or imagines that if they were, were interpreted by a court, they would say, well, this law purports to be about animal safety, et cetera, et cetera. So presumably the harm is harm to animals as opposed to harm to the business operations of a particular agricultural company. Um, and then what Jody was pointing to with regard to the whistleblower um, requirement, and that is, uh, obtaining evidence of illegal activity. Well, to follow up on that, yes, we may want to, we, we, it may be valuable for the public to see uh, what is in fact lawful activity going on on farm properties, because we might be quite horrified by certain so-called lawful activities. And again, just to add what Jody said, the requirement that it be reported immediately, again, reinforces this idea that it's not so much to go public that it really is something to go into the legal system and to be confined to the depiction or the, 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 the recording of activity that is unlawful in character. Okay, I'll say no more. Thanks, I mean, the other thing that, that Rob mentioned, Jody, maybe I can pose this one to you and you can, um, you can add what you wanted to add. Um, because the other theme that Rob mentioned that I wanted to talk about was, was whether this is sort of uh, agricultural exceptionalism or um, you know, or whether laws like this might be um, might start spreading into different areas. So I mean, we know that um, you know when it comes to labor laws, for example, farms are typically outside the the scope that um, govern most workplaces, uh, at least in Ontario. Um, so is this uh, you know the agricultural industry um, successful lobbying and something that we expect to be confined, or do do we need to worry about seeing these types of laws in other in other areas? Yeah, so I'll answer that kind of in in two parts, if I will. Um, uh, in terms of agricultural exceptionalism, I just wanted to pick up on on Dick's point about uh, what is a lawful uh, activity on a farm, and and the fact is. And this is a perfect example of agricultural exceptionalism that there are no written statutes or laws about what constitutes legal or lawful or unlawful conduct uh, when it comes to the treatment of animals on farms. There are codes of practice written by uh, the industry with some input from humane organizations and that kind of thing, but majoritarily written by industry and industry stakeholders. Um, and, and that is the, the law on, on farms. Um, so that's an interesting point that you have to capture some kind of illegal conduct. Um, so that's a whole other kind of problem, but it is uh, an example of um, what, what you just referred to, Kara, of agricultural exceptionalism. So uh, the, agri the agriculture industry in Canada uh, is a huge lobbyist. Um, and I have read reports that they were involved uh, in lobbying for these types of laws. And um, as you said, they're exempt from labor practices. They are exempt from free trade restrictions. They're exempt from environmental regulations. There's currently another private members bill going through parliament to further exempt um, industrial agriculture from uh, the, some of the provisions of the, the carbon tax. Um, and of course, they're exempt from um, animal welfare laws. Every provincial law uh, setting out uh, you know, the legal treatment of animals or duties of care toward animals, they all contain an explicit expression uh, exemption for uh, agricultural activities. 
Um, so certainly it's an example of that. Uh, and then the second part was, should we worry about this going uh, into other places? Well, I, I probably should have mentioned this at the outset, but the Alberta law, um, Bill 27, which amended the trespass, uh, a bunch of trespass statutes in Alberta, is not confined to agriculture. It applies to all private property. So it is now illegal to enter on false pretenses into a daycare or a, a long-term care facility or well, prison. Prisons are not really private, but, um, you know, so yes, I think we, we should be, we should be worried um, in, in that respect. Uh, that's not true of the other jurisdictions where the laws are specific to ag. Um, and in Alberta, it's actually the penalties are, are even more severe with respect to agricultural properties, but um, it, it's not it's not limited to agriculture either in um, in Alberta. Rob, do you want to do you want to comment on what you I mean, because you mentioned this concern about, you know, other industries that might like to have this kind of protection. And I think Jody gave some uh, good examples in Alberta of, of ones that might like that. Um, I mean, are there other things that you sort of have in mind, I guess, uh, maybe um, maybe they're the kinds of uh, venues or industries where the exceptional kind of undercover journalistic work might might happen? Yeah, I mean, imagine where we might be uh, if if there was no such thing as undercover reporting in um, in elderly housing facilities. I mean, some of the most groundbreaking work that has inspired dramatic public policy changes and investments affecting the most vulnerable citizens in our country have come uh, after um, exposés into these sort of things. I have colleagues that did exactly that kind of work in Ontario, and it's, it's actually stunning to me that, that that work would be now considered illegal in Alberta. I didn't know that until I came across all of this and I read Jody's work. I mean, it, it's, it's breathtaking to me. Uh, that in Canada, in the province in Canada, journalists would face potential prosecution for that kind of work, which would be done entirely in the service of the public interest to protect the most vulnerable citizens in our society. I just can't imagine that this is the, the proper intention of lawmakers to, to restrict that kind of uh, probing journalism that, that we know so well. I mean, so there's any number of uh, areas where that uh, this, this kind of restriction would be potentially devastating to um, to journalistic work that that would and often does reveal kinds of troubling uncomfortable truths that inspire public policy change and contrition from governments and promises to make it better um, what about so i, I want to i mean i want to continue to think about um I guess the the journalism angle um, it, from a, a constitutional freedom of expression and, and freedom of the press perspective, because I'm wondering if, I mean, we've talked about the inadequacy of um, the exception in Ontario for, for journalism. Um, what about the absence of any uh, exemption for, for journalism in Alberta, for example? I mean, I don't know, Dick or Jody, is that something that you could see being a um, you know, another way to sort of tackle this in terms of, um, again, I agree, it's not a straightforward freedom of expression claim, but um, perhaps a, a freedom of the press, um, you know, a challenge under 2B related to, to freedom of the press. I guess, okay, I guess it's up to me to say <laughs> something. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I'm not, um, I'm not somebody who recognizes, um, at least with the way our charter is read, a firm distinction between freedom of expression and freedom of the press or freedom of the media. Obviously, the media does have, and the courts have signaled, certain uh, rights or privileges under the charter that perhaps uh, an ordinary individual doesn't have because of the kind of public function, uh, important public function they perform. That may be watered down a little bit now that the definition of what counts as the press or journalism has been expanded so significantly. But with that said, sure, I mean, I think the absence of such an exception just raises, you know, a, a much more profound uh, concern about freedom of expression. Uh, even if the Ontario law's exception has these 
problems in its scope exactly and its ambiguities. Um, it is something, but the complete absence of such an exception seems to me to be entirely problematic and to certainly heighten the, the, the increase the strength of the, um, of the freedom of expression claim to be made against the legislation. Anything you wanted to add, Jody? Um, not so much about uh, that. That I agree uh, with with it, um, with with everything that he just said. But um, one thing that we haven't mentioned with respect to other industries that might be uh, you know protected here is a, a second act in Alberta, the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act, which is which was adopted just after Bill 27 in Alberta, which um, does the same thing as the Ontario um, law with respect to um, transport and protests on highways and public places, um, but, but also immunizes all kinds of other um, industries like uh, oil and gas and resource extraction. Um, and that was a law adopted in response to uh, pipeline protests um, or uh, protests in solidarity with some of the indigenous groups who were, who were against the pipeline expansions about, about a year ago. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, okay, so that's just an example of this kind of law uh, prohibiting um, protest and freedom of expression and the right to uh, gather um, for particular industries. And that relates to agriculture. And again, those other industries, any kind of anything really that the government deems uh, essential infrastructure uh, or critical infrastructure. So there is a list and then there's also the ability for uh, the government to add to that list. So very broad. Again, um, I, I don't know how far that you know that that has the same implications with with respect to journalism, but certainly with respect to um, advocacy and protest and um, the right to you know peaceful protest and expression. Right, so a, sort of a broader um, attack on activism in in its various forms. And um, so, um, are there legal challenges to to these laws? Um, and and do you want to? talk, I, I'm aware of one that, that was recently initiated in Ontario. Um, mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about, about that and um, what that looks like? Uh, yeah, so um, the legal advocacy group Animal Justice, um, I think yesterday, filed a constitutional challenge suing um, the Ontario government, um, arguing that the Ontario ag-gag law is, uh, is unconstitutional. It's a limit on freedom of expression. Um, an arguably an unjustified limit. Um, and there, there's other stuff in there as well because there, uh, there are citizens arrest provisions um, in there and um, use of force provisions. Um, so the challenge is, is pretty broad and it, and it encompasses all, all of that. Um, and then in, in Alberta, the um, teachers union has launched a challenge a couple of months ago um, to the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act and the prohibition on um, protest um, with res presumably with respect to you know, picketing and that kind of thing um, in, in public places. So those are both happening. Um, I, I don't think they've moved too far at the moment, um, but we, we will you know, hopefully uh, get to hear from a court um, about you know, both of these types of laws. Yeah, I think I, I wonder maybe Dick, if you can address this because I, in, in my work at CCLA, sometimes I'm thinking about laws that restrict the right to protest. And usually they're laws that deal with, you know, you, you can't block the highway or um, there's nuisance by laws and things like that that municipalities have. They're usually not laws that are actually, you know, necessarily designed to, comp to, to, uh, to, to fight people who are protesting. Um, these are, are quite different because they, they arguably do kind of target that a bit more. Yeah, I mean, there's a few things to be said about it. I mean, one of them is it talks about, you know, stopping, hindering, obstructing transit. Well, any kind of protest involves hindrance. I mean, that's the very nature of any kind of public protest that it will be uh, disruptive or cause people to have to change, you know, the way they move on a sidewalk at minimum. 
things like that. So that's that's the I think the first thing um, to note. Now I'm busy trying to think what it, what it was you asked me exactly. <laughs> no, 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 just that this was this was something that was a little different. In terms yeah. Of oh no, 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 you're right. Um, and and of course. One could imagine enacting a law to address a particular kind of protest that was particularly disruptive and targeted at a particular business or industry. That's imaginable. But of course, if the reason for doing, for putting in place such a law is to particularly protect that business, if it's really about the kind of content of the, of the protest, then of course that really does raise very deep free speech uh, concerns. Um, so I think that's a, a real central question that would have to be addressed. Okay, I'm gonna. I, I want to get to to questions from um, from the audience in just a minute. Maybe I can just pose one one last question. Um, usually, um, in Canada, we do things that have already been tried somewhere else. <laughs> so I, I know there's a history of, of some of these laws in the states, and also a history of, of challenging them. So can you, um, maybe Jody, you're probably the one best place to, to talk to us about um, the experience there. Yeah, without getting into too much detail, um, it's very similar laws which have prohibited entry based on false pretenses um, or uh, obtaining employment through false pretenses or what have you and on agricultural properties have pretty unanimously been struck down as unconstitutional uh, violations of um, the First Amendment protection uh, protection of free speech. Um, the legal analysis is different here, of course. We have a, a justification uh, clause, which makes it a little easier to limit fundamental freedoms in Canada. But ultimately, um, the an the analysis is is very similar, um, and they have failed in the U.S. And um, well, we'll see what happens here. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, before I invite questions, anything the panelists wanted to, to chime in with? I could say just maybe one more thought. The, 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 the relationship between journalists and sources is also relevant here, of course. Um, these are not often two separate parallel pillars that don't intersect. It's very frequently the case that we as journalists get on to stories like this because we're approached by uh, whistleblowers. They show up uh, with uh, video or um, information or sources or former employees, et cetera. And that's often the starting point. Um, now, we would never just sort of take it and, and publish it. It's always the beginning of a conversation, but it, If through independent verification and working other sources and independently kind of verifying there's something here, uh, then we will elevate it to the next stage and we'll do independent reporting. And, and in at least one story that I've worked on, that was the case. So there is a relationship here. And so the curtailing of, of whistleblowers is also sometimes the curtailing of journalism in the sense that we need, in many cases, we need sources. Um, who are going to bring to light this information to us and then we then can go out and verify whether we think it's uh, it, reportable provable in the public interest etc so I, I just throw that in as a as a texture to all of this that that we really do there is some synergy here between journalist and source and in fact you know the, the Ontario law and I guess the others uh, as well seek to uh, curtail the efforts of, of both. And so, you know, it, it really is cumulatively um, a watering down of our ability to do this kind of work. So. Thanks. Um, all right, so Ange, I think we are ready for our first question from, from the audience. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, the first question uh, is, can, given that many farms are also people's homes, it seems like a basic safety precaution to not allow people who gain entry on false pretenses in order to be safe, particularly if they're, or they are recording footage perhaps of children. Do you, can the panelists comment on that? Yeah, so this is, I think, often, uh, you know, I know in some of the debates leading up to the enactment of these laws, there's discussion about these family farms and the need to, to protect people on them. So, I mean, is that a valid 
concern and how do we address it? Jody, do you want to start? Sure, sure. Um, I, I, I'd say a, a couple of things. Um, you know, uh, you know, in practice, I, I, I can say that from conversations and from stuff I've, that I have read and heard and and uh, yeah, um, activists are not interested in, in harming individuals. You know, um, no nobody is going to take a photograph of of a child that lives on a farm and publicize it or or anything like that. Um, so there, there's that. Uh, I guess another thing is that an unconstitutional law is an unconstitutional law, whether you're on public property or private property. And, um, you know, the impacts of these laws are to limit a significant kind of speech. Another thing I'd say is that the privacy interest on a commercial farm, it simply can't be the same as a privacy interest in your living room or, or your bathroom. You know, um, barns are separate from homes. They are not where individuals live. Activists go out of their way to avoid confrontations with um, homeowners and, and that kind of thing. Another thing I'll say is that these laws are extremely broad. The Ontario law applies not just to uh, farms, um, but also to like um, rodeos and horse racing and petting zoos and um, like a horse, horse-drawn carriage businesses. These are not places where people live, which really makes me question the motives um, behind the legislation. Again, is it about protecting individual safety or is it about you know, uh, uh, eliminating any transparency uh, with respect to animals used in, in agriculture and, and outside of agriculture as well, clearly. Um, yeah, finally, I'd say that the transport issues, uh, provisions are not, they're not, that's not private property. So, you know, saying you're not allowed to line up outside of a truck um, is uh, just, that's just not a, not a concern. I guess I, 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 would, I would want to see the evidence um, that that um, undercover investigators, it, whistleblowers, that they're actually causing any harm or threatening the safety of individuals. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just jump in on that. I, I understand the argument, but you know, really, in the context of how this really works, it doesn't fly. I mean, one of the investigations I mentioned earlier was into illegal slaughterhouses. So these are we went into people's property, and in some cases, they lived there but they were running an operation, a commercial operation out of the barn. And in one case, that operation was supplying meat products to long-term care homes. I mean, so yeah, we went on private property. We opposed it. Purchasing, and it was on this property where this guy lived. His house was right over there, but we're not there for that. We're clearly there for, to look into the commercial operation which was posing a threat to the to public safety. I, I mean, I'm not the lawyer here, I'm the only non-lawyer here, but I mean, I, I think there's a vigorous argument to be made that that's well within the mandate of, of investigative journalism to do that, whether or not it's there's a house down the road. Yeah, it seems to me that the law really only, if it kicks in, is only gonna kick in after somebody has obtained some information, some film, whatever it might be about the operation of farm. And it's then in some sense made public. But that's when this law comes into play. And that's in fact why it is uh, apparently in its operation an interference with free speech, because that's what it's about. It's meant to stop that kind of activity at the end of the process. The individual who presumably has entered as an employee in a formal sense is presumably conducting him or herself as any employee would, except perhaps surreptitiously taking note of various things that are occurring. So it just strikes me that the way it works, um, you know, doesn't raise those sorts of um, private personal issues that might arise. And if that really were the concern, the law could be written in an entirely different way to address that. Right. Yeah, we can envision a, a much more narrowly tailored uh, approach to deal with that. Um, okay, Anne, is there another question you want to, to put to us? Uh, yes, there is. There's quite a few. Uh, the next question, uh, somebody asked, can the speakers talk about the right to know in Canadian law? What exactly does it mean, guarantee? Who does it apply to and where is it articulated? 
maybe maybe Dick, we get to start with you on this one. You're muted though. <laughs> yeah. Cara, I don't know. Maybe you should be answering this. Okay. I mean, uh, I think the really simple answer, for which a caveat has to be attached, is there isn't really a right to access information under freedom of expression. Now, with that said, the courts have suggested that maybe in some unspecified circumstances, uh, when it's necessary for a uh, meaningful public conversation on an issue to occur, there might be some kind of right of access. Now, Cara, you may even know more about this than I do. I'm not really sure what those circumstances are exactly, but as a general rule, there is no right to information. There is no right to access, um, well, I was gonna say, there are rights to access state-owned properties, but only those properties that are generally open to the public anyway. But in terms of information, I think the simplest answer is no. But Cara, you, I, uh, you have Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm sure um, maybe Jody and Rob would wanna weigh in on this one also. I, I, I mean, the, the what Dick is talking about is, um, you know, there's, there is a, a case from the Supreme Court that talks about this idea that, um, that access to information is kind of a derivative right of freedom of expression. And I, as far as I know, it's the only derivative right that's been recognized in Canada. And I'm not exactly sure what a derivative right really means, um, but there is a little opening there. Um, the case that recognized it didn't apply it in that case. So it, it wasn't, that, that case was not one of the circumstances where they said getting this information is required for, you know, um, meaningful democratic debate and discussion about a topic, uh, but they did leave that door open. Um, and, you know, I could imagine, um, I could imagine situations involving these laws um, that could be used to kind of um, creak that, creak that, that door open a little bit, a little bit wider. Um, you know, especially because we're we're talking not only about the treatment of, of animals and um, the safety of the food supply, but also potentially about um, working conditions and the safety of, of individuals who work in these um, in these venues. Um, Jody or Rob, do you want to? Uh, I don't have an answer on that. Okay, J Jody. I, I mean, I. I think I would go further and I would say that the sort of corollary to the right to express yourself is, is the right to listen. And I, I do think that the, the court has hinted on various occasions that that, 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 that is a right protected by 2B. Um, more recently, this isn't the Supreme Court of Canada, but uh, one judge at the federal court um, has written that the right to know where your food comes from and the right to make ethical choices about your food purchasing is protected by the charter. And um, the inability to do that based on like false labeling or, or what have you, uh, or something like this, um, is a limit to not just freedom of expression, but freedom of conscience if you, um, are making your purchasing choices based on deeply held ethical beliefs, which, you know, certainly a lot of people are doing with respect to animal products. So, um, I mean, there's obviously room for the court to go a little further here, and that's just a federal court decision, but it's one that I find very compelling. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to belabor, belabor this. I mean, of course, I mean, freedom of expression protects the right to speak and the right to hear or, you know, right to read or however we want to frame it. Generally speaking, it's I have the right to hear what others are willing to provide information to me. Now, you're referring, I assume, to the Kattenberg case, and that's kind of interesting, and we'll see what comes from it. I'm not super optimistic, but we'll, we'll, we will see for sure. Yeah. Okay, I'm told we have a lot of questions. So, um, Ange, do you want to give us a, a, a the next one and we'll try and get through as many as we can? Yes. Uh, the next one uh, is, could anyone on the panel clarify for me about what we mean when you talk about farms and farmers? What comes to mind for many of us as a farm couple and their children and a few farm workers trying to make a living under difficult circumstances? But isn't the reality that most agricultural production in Canada from ranches to slaughterhouses to meat packing is run by large and powerful, often transnational corporations. Aren't ag-gag laws about protecting these corporate corporations' interests? 
A question and an answer in one. Yeah, it sounds like the person posing the question knows quite a lot about this, maybe. Um, I don't know, is there any any comment here? I mean, I think that goes a little bit to the first question we had, you know, about is this, aren't we trying to protect, um, you know, the, the children that live on the farms? I know that the, I think the Manitoba law, um, I haven't read it yet, but I, I know that it was framed in terms of this larger discussion around kind of protecting people in rural areas, um, you know, which which I think also sort of paints that picture of, um, you know, the family farm. Um, Jody, do you know sort of like the proportions, I guess, in terms of, of um, the, the breakdown of, of how much food is produced, uh, you know, in one type versus? I, I don't have specific numbers, but I can say that the situation in Canada, while it's not quite as, as bad as the US right now in terms of corporate farming is not that far off. You know, in the US we have, um, they have uh, uh, CAFOs, um, confined, concentrated animal feed operations, which are, you know, factories and the conditions there are horrible. And the parallel in, uh, in Canada is called an intensive livestock operation. And those are increasing um, in number. You know, we talked earlier about the uh, labor protections for agriculture. There's a Supreme Court case about that, Dunmore. Um, you know, upholding the exclusion of agricultural workers from, uh, you know, labor protections, the ability to like unionize and, 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 ne and negotiate. What that case also said was that family farms are, are, they talked about the erosion of family farms as typical of Ontario agriculture. And, and said that there's a distinction between those family farms, you know, that we think of these like bucolic farms with red barns and corporate farming agribusiness. And, you know, uh, almost two decades ago, the North American uh, livestock industry uh, had changed dramatically with respect to the numbers. So like, no, I don't have exact numbers, but I don't think it's accurate to picture, you know, a picket fence and a, and a farm family. I mean, think about it. Have, have you ever seen a pig outdoors driving down the road? A couple of years ago, I was driving through the Eastern Townships in Quebec and I saw some pigs outside and I was like, I, I have never seen that before. So what does that tell you about like how pigs are, are raised today, right? It's also, it's also worth noting that I had a look at the lobbying records on this and it's, it's big multinational corporations that are pushing this, right? Maple Leaf is one of the uh, uh, lobbying and according to the records, and we know Maple Leaf obviously is a gigantic corporate entity. So it strikes me that there might be a case to be made that um, this legislation has been spurred on by big business. Okay. Are there um, uh, are there laws like this in the UK? Do you know? I think there are not, um, although there are some in Australia and there have been attempts in other, other in European countries. Um, and um, I, I've been told recently that actually there are new regulations requiring slaughter, uh, farm slaughterhouses to have cameras uh, it, on at all times uh, in, in the UK, but I have to verify that I haven't, I haven't looked into it yet, but this is not a uniquely North American phenomenon. Um, Ange, do you want to tee up another one? Uh, yep, the next one is, uh, uh, somebody asked, is the panel familiar with the trials and charges against activists? Any thoughts on this? And uh, there's some examples of the entering, and entering industrial places where abuses are exposed. Uh, pig trial two, pig trial three, mink trial, sled dog facilities. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I remember reading about the, the woman who, you know, gave up uh, an animal some water on a, on a truck. Um, and uh, th maybe those are the pig trials that are being talked about. Jody, do you want to comment? Yeah, um, it, they, I mean, pig trial one, <laughs> RV crimes. Um, 
a couple of years ago, uh, Sonita Crines is the founder of the Save Movement, who is the group of people, ac activists who protest and hold vigil vigils and bear witness outside of slaughterhouses. She was feeding water to a pig outside of a slaughterhouse through the, you know, the slots in the truck on a very hot day. Um, you can imagine how hot it is in those trucks. They're not temperature controlled um, when it's 40 degrees outside, you know, in the city. Um, and she got in an altercation with the um, driver. And uh, anyway, she was arrested for mischief and charged with mischief under the criminal code. And all, all I'm gonna say about that is that is the, the impetus for the transport related provisions in the ag on uh, all of these laws. But another interesting thing um, is that in that case, you know, the Crown and the, uh, the trucking, the transport company tried to argue that uh, there's a danger to the animals there because, you know, it's impossible to know what what the pigs are being given, you know, maybe there's something in the water um, that would spoil the load, so to speak. But there was also evidence that this is something that the activists have been doing for months and years, and that no load had ever been rejected. Um, so that really undermines the argument that that these people uh, pose any kind of like biosecurity hazard or, or danger to the food system. And I know there are all kinds of other cases um, and it'll only get worse <laughs> with these, uh, with these laws. Mm -hmm. okay. And do you wanna give us another one? Uh, yeah, so the next one, uh, somebody asks, uh, asks much of the long-term care industry is privatized. Would the Alberta egg gag law apply to public long-term facilities, long-term care facilities? Hmm. Do you, um, Jody? do you know, or Rob, do you, do you know from having looked at that, whether it would? Uh, I don't, I, I, I think it just applies to private property. Um, I wouldn't even call it, you know, it's a form of agag, yeah, but it, it really is much broader anti-trespass law and the, the trespass provisions there. I'd have to look more closely at it. I mean, presumably, even though these are public, there are public institutions, I mean, they, they still have rights of, as, as occupiers and um, property owners to, to kick people off if they're trespassing. So I think even in a public facility, you probably have the same the same issues, um, uh, and the the Alberta law does have this false pretenses provision, right? I think you mentioned the Manitoba one doesn't, but it does. Yeah, Manitoba does not. Okay. Okay. Um, and do you want to give us another? Uh, yep. Uh, the next question. Uh, there have been incidents where a lot of people were trespassing on farm properties, trapping people in their homes, and stealing their livestock as a form of protest. As a matter of practicality, family farmers are vulnerable to this type of invasion of their homes and the lines between house and barn, both private property, are not clear cut. What would you suggest to protect these family farmers who are not breaking any laws and who have children present around the property, often caring for livestock, such as 4-H programs? Okay, so this gets to some of, I mean, some of the issues we talked about before. Dick, go ahead. Well, no, if I understand it, probably just sounds like pretty straightforward trespass and breach of trespass and interference with property and, uh, you know, would be clearly unlawful. And this law would have no relation to that kind of activity, what we're talking about. I don't think anybody would uh, be troubled with the enforcement of trespass law in a situation where people were being physically interfered with, uh, property damaged or whatever. Now, obviously, there are acts of civil disobedience you know, that can, acts that can be unlawful and someone believes that um, there is a moral urgency to responding or to addressing and perhaps to rescuing animals, whatever it might be. So I don't want to be understood as commenting on the appropriateness of individuals sometimes engaging in acts of civil disobedience. But as the law stands, it seems to me that would be, the act, activity described would be clearly unlawful. Right, so I think that, I mean, the idea here is that we, um, I mean, that that activity, we don't need these ag, -AG laws to deal with that. We, we already have, you know, trespass laws. And um, as I think Jody mentioned in Alberta, you know, this was just, this was an amendment to various trespass laws um, rather than something that was specifically targeting the agricultural uh, industry um, and increasing the, the, um, 
you know, the, the consequences for, for breaching those rules. There's always been a, a right to, to kick people off your property. Um, what makes this unique is that, um, at least in the Alberta and Ontario laws, um, if you let someone on your property because you think they're coming to work for you and in fact, they're coming to expose wrongdoing, um, they can be seen as trespassing or charge, charged uh, with, with trespassing. Okay. Um, Ange, do you wanna? Yeah, yeah you're ready for another one. Uh, okay, uh, the next one, what can somebody ask, what can we non-journalist citizens do to protest these laws? Anyone wanna? So, I mean, maybe I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, so, um, I mean, the, the laws have been passed in Ontario, Alberta, um, uh, PEI, I think uh, Judy mentioned. Um, the Manitoba one was just tabled. So, um, you know, um, there's still some advocacy that can be done uh, before that uh, legislature to, to urge them not to do this. Um, similarly, the, the, the federal, um, I think it's a private member's bill. If that goes to committee, there, there are submission, you know, you can, you can make written submissions, you can ask to appear before committee. Um, there's, there's work there that you can do in terms of advocacy. Um, there are these organizations, Jody mentioned Animal Justice, that's filed the, the Ontario um, Challenge. Um, the, in Alberta, there's the Teachers Union that's filed the challenge to the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act. Um, so those organizations, I'm sure, would, would welcome support um, in their legal challenges. It's not, um, not an inconsequential or easy or inexpensive thing to do to challenge a piece of legislation, especially, um, you know, we can imagine that if this was something that was heavily lobbied uh, by industry, um, even if uh, even if the government loses a round in court, they're likely to keep to keep fighting. Um, so there's this is these are the kinds of cases that are likely to you know to go up to appeal courts and possibly uh, to the Supreme Court. Um, so I would say you know watch those organizations and see how you can uh, lend support. Um, anyone wanna Rob wanna thoughts on how people? Yeah. Can? I actually think like. I'm a little puzzled why there isn't more outcry and protest from the journalistic community, man. If I were in, in Alberta, it strikes me that this should be an issue that journalists should be speaking about, media organizations should be speaking about. Um, I just, you know, I haven't heard anything about it. It's been silence, and, and that is particularly egregious there. Um, but even in Ontario, I, there, I, I just feel that somehow that this is. This is somehow uh, slipped under the radar, actually. I mean, until it was brought to my attention um, a few months ago, I, I really, you know, it's very good kind of conversations. I think for a lot of people, this is fairly new, including journalists. Um, so it's it's one of those weird ones where uh, journalists themselves, I feel like, ha have not fully engaged on something that is so crucial to the core, like a core fundamental element of what we do. Um, so my hope is that through through this challenge and, and through conversations like this, that um, certainly the public, of course, because nobody really cares what journalists think. It's not until uh, constituents, voters um, align and, um, and you know contact their political representatives that um, there's going to be a focusing of the political mindset. There's no question about that, but at the very least, it seems to me that journalists should be engaging on this issue. Jody, was there anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, I agree with all that, you know. Um, letters to the editor, write to your MP, write to your MLA, you know. Even in places where the laws have been adopted, governments are temporary. <laughs> you know um yeah no i would just repeat everything that's already been said and yeah the uh part of the federal bill went to committee uh yesterday so um it's pretty easy to go on the website um and and submit uh you know testimony or a letter or, or whatever it is an email even now's the time to email your mp if you're if you're concerned about this yeah 
and obviously subscribe to the channel. Stop. <laughs> um, uh, there was something I wanted to add about um, about that issue. Um, oh, uh, just to, to Rob mentioned that you know some of these have slipped under the radar. I think that's the um, Unfortunately, you know, some of these laws, uh, the, the Ontario one, I think, went to committee, you know, in the, within the last year. Um, so it was it was COVID, and even, you know, CCLA had planned to um, to make submissions. We did we did make written submissions on this bill, but um, there was so much going on that we we couldn't dedicate, you know, as, as much as we would have liked. And I, you know, I I think that's the the case, unfortunately, with. Um, you know, with the last year that people are have have been preoccupied, and um, and in some cases, some of these laws have um, have you know not faced the kind of opposition that you might expect if they've been you know brought forward at a different at a different time. I think you're right. I mean, this is this is a great. This past year has been a great time period to bring in controversial legislation <laughs> like this, just because there's only been one story. We're all all journalists are working on one story, and. You know, the kind of, I, I just can't help but think that two years ago, this would have received tre tremendous scrutiny. I just really think it would have. It just, it just didn't this time. And I think it's because we're all obsessively focused on one story. Yeah, I think even in Alberta with the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act, I mean, I think when that was first introduced, it was, it was pre-pandemic and there was quite a lot of outcry about it because it was very clearly, you know, directly in response to to indigenous blockades and um and then I, I think when the law actually went to to committee and was passed was was post the beginning of of uh of the pandemic and and you know it just didn't get as much attention as as it probably would have otherwise it, it could be that this this is one of those issues that will require a lightning rod moment right it'll be a an activist or a journalist arrested by, um, I guess, a worker at a facility, which this law seems to empower and held forcibly by a security guard. Um, it, it may just take that kind of moment um, before there's, there's real scrutiny and discussion about it. And at that point, I think there'll be real questions, specific, practical, real world questions about whether this is appropriate or not. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one would hope that we don't really need to do that, surely, in this day and age. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's why, you know, the, the, there has, has been a proactive legal challenge rather than waiting for, for that um, ideal case. Because I think we can also anticipate that, you know, the government might be careful about exactly how uh, how they enforce this law and where they enforce it to, um, to not necessarily give rise to that you know, ideal test case that that a lawyer might be might be looking for. Um, yeah, um, I imagine. I, I, I mean, I agree with you, but before it ever. Oh, you're let me just say, like, I, I agree with you that the handling of it within by government, the court. Sorry, sorry. Did, did I freeze there? A little bit. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's happened a couple times. The handling by government, the courts is one thing, but Joe, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but this really does empower citizen arrest. Like long before it ever gets to a judge or before a, a government bureaucrat, there could be citizen arrests here, which is extraordinary to me. Like it's a throwback. Um, and, and the legislation has empowered that kind of citizen arrest. So I could be next week, if I'm doing an undercover at a facility, I, you know, I could be forcibly locked in a room or something, I think, according to my reading of this. I mean, that's, to me, that's extraordinary. Is that right, Jay? Like, is that your read of it? That literally the plant manager could have me arrested by security and held. I don't know how long they would be able to hold you, but certainly they can arrest you and hold you until the police arrive and then yeah. turn you over to the police. Um, in terms of like just the, the impacts of the law, I'll just say that tensions around um, slaughterhouse protests have certainly increased since, um, since the law was adopted. Um, the uh, false pretenses stuff just went into effect recently because we were waiting for the regulation, but the, the transport provisions and, and the safe movement stuff has been enforced since June. 
And there are now counter protests by um, pro ag um, or ag supporters. Um, and it's, uh, it's really, it's really, tensions are really high. Yeah. I mean, laws like this are often, you know, intended less to be enforced and more to discourage people out of fear that they might be uh, the subject to it. I mean, imagine a situation where somebody actually did obtain access to a farm property, recorded material showing, uh, you know, horrific abuse, and that was made public. We, I don't think I could imagine the um, the state, the province, deciding they were going to prosecute a person in that situation. That would bring the law entirely into disrepute if it were to be enforced in that circumstance. So I think less often it's about is is not so much about enforcement as about the fear of enforcement and the the attempt to chill any kind of activity around this. People are being ticketed outside of slaughterhouses though, since it went into effect. Um, not, I don't know about interference uh, or interaction. I think people are chilled from interacting. They're mm -hmm. afraid to go up to the trucks, but uh, certainly people have been given um, summary offense tickets for uh, interfering, um, like you say, obstructing, hindering, yeah. I mean, I was thinking more of the false pretenses, but sure. absolutely, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, and do you want to give us, uh, maybe we have time for one or two more uh, questions. Uh, yep, yeah, okay. Uh, the next question, are there some arguments you anticipate that Ontario and Alberta may raise that could have some traction in the courts? Who wants to make the government's case? <laughs> I've written about this, so uh, I also don't want to like dominate the conversation. But yeah, I mean, they're going to they're gonna argue that, that it's about farmer safety and biosecurity. Um, but it'll also be up to them, um, you know, when, when, I mean, the, the freedom of expression breach is, is uh, like we've heard, it's not super straightforward, but it's not that hard to make out. It's a very low bar, but um, the burden to justify charter infringing legislation is on the government. And it's an evidence-based analysis. You know, I think we forget that sometimes, but section one of the charter says that limits need to be demonstrably justified. So it's hard forgets that sometimes too. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when sort my editorial <laughs> comment there, but <laughs> you're allowed. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, when you, of course, it will be. I mean, the law presents itself as being a law about farm safety, uh, a law about I don't know deception, maybe not, or you know, physical interference and and various things of that kind. That's how it presents itself. So that will be presumably the argument. And the question is, uh, how easy is it to see through that and recognize that the harm, and we'll use the word very carefully, the harm that it's really meant to get at is. Um, concern about, well, protest in one regard, but with regard to the false pretenses provision, it's concern about the embarrassment that will occur if information gets out about what may be going on in many of these operations. So it, it's not hard to, to see through all of that kind of formal presentation of the law, but presumably that will be the argument that's made. And, um, and I, am I right that you know, I know one of the things that I've heard um, animal rights activists talk about with this law um, or laws like this is that, you know, they're framed as this concern about animal safety and biosecurity, but um, but actually laws to keep animals safe um, and uh, and ensure biosecurity are um, pretty few and far between in, in these jurisdictions. Certainly those would go a long way toward achieving the purported objectives of animal safety and biosecurity, right. yes. And presumably be less intrusive on freedom of expression. Of course. Uh, um, Ange, do you, um, do you wanna give us uh, maybe one more? Sure, yeah, I got one more for you. Uh, are there parts of the law that you support or agree with? Yeah, good question. Anyone want to? <laughs> I think our silence speaks volumes here. <laughs> I, I try for the most part to present myself as someone who will lay out the constitutional argument or the merits of it or whatever without getting into the details. I mean, I mean, clearly, people who are engaging in a lawful activity um, 
you know, driving a truck or whatever, um, should not be obstructed in doing that. Now, of course, if we think the activity they're engaged in is fundamentally immoral and wrongful, then as I said before, there's a place for civil disobedience. And so I don't want to pass any firm judgment on the appropriateness of, of obstructing and trying to hinder those activities, because I do understand the kind of very deep moral question uh, at stake here, certainly for many people. So I, yeah, I <laughs> like, like Jody, I'll just stay silent otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think for, for me, there's, um you know, the, the purported objectives of the law are, are valuable ones. Um, I guess, you know, I just question whether the, the law itself is, is actually achieving those purposes. I mean, you know, even if you think it's wrong to give the pig water, um, we didn't have an ag gag law and that woman was prosecuted. So th there wasn't an absence of, of legal tools, um, you know, to do this. Um, it, it, the I think the kind of new element that that's been brought in is is really that that false pretenses um, piece and um, you know and and just making it I guess creating some more tools really um, to to deal with the same type of behavior. She was acquitted for what uh, it's worth, which explains a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know, maybe we, maybe we can squeeze one more in, Ange, if you have. Uh, there's been a few questions similar um, about asking about how to combat the claims around protecting biosecurity. Um, I know you've spoken to some of it, but if we could say more. I'll just reiterate that it's not up to the people challenging the law to, <laughs> to prove that biosecurity is not an issue. I mean, of course, everyone wants to bring their best evidence, but it's up to the government to bring their best evidence that biosecurity is threatened by undercover investigations and journalistic exposés. Is there somewhere, if I'm someone who wants to know, like what are the laws that govern how my food is protected or produced or um, other than going, you know, going on to e-laws and trying to just do a random search, like where, where would I find that kind of information? It's very difficult to find. It's a patchwork of information and a combination of provincial laws and federal laws and laws regarding slaughter and laws regarding transport and non-laws regarding animal welfare and animal treatment. And, um, you know, there it, it, it would be very difficult to uncover. I have trouble finding that stuff. And my job, I'm, I, I'm a legal researcher. Um, so for uh, the average citizen to to learn about that stuff, I guess the point here is that undercover investigations and exposés are really one of the only ways that that we can that we can know about this. Farms are not open to the public. Slaughterhouses are not open to the public. Um, so you know, cutting off this avenue is 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 a serious it's a serious restriction on 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 speech and on the public's right to information. Jody, um, does any any of the panelists want to put on a last word before I hand things back to Jim? Okay, well, thank thank you all um, for for this very interesting discussion, and um, I think Jim is going to come come back on and uh, talk a bit about what um, what the Center for Free Expression has has coming up. Well, I want to thank uh, you, Kara, and the panel very much for an informative and lively discussion. And also the audience, there were a lot of good questions. There's a lot of concern. Um, and one of, the, one of the people was asking about where they could get more information. Uh, all of the Center for Free Expression panels and events are recorded and a video recording of today's event will be posted on our website tomorrow. And our website is cfe.ryerson.ca. One of the other things we've started doing, because there is often interest in reading more about an issue, is we've asked the panelists uh, to send us some material that uh, a person who would be interested in reading more could find useful. So we're going to ask each of the panelists, and so next to the podcast, although it won't be up tomorrow as the podcast will, uh, we'll have a little reading list, not a heavy-duty academic bibliography, but uh, some additional articles or material one could read to dig into this issue a bit more. So I, I really do want to thank all of you for 
uh, for participating in this. The next Center for Free Expression event will be uh, about four weeks from today. It'll be on Tuesday, April 13th. And the title of it is Conflict is Not Abuse, Overstating Harm, Community Responsibility, and the Duty of Repair. Uh, this conversation features Sarah Schulman, who's an award-winning novelist, playwright, nonfiction writer, screenwriter, gay activist, AIDS historian, and recipient of the Kessler Award for Sustained Contribution to LGBTQ Studies. She's a distinguished professor of humanities at the City University of New York, College of Staten Island, who has uh, really written uh, uh, authoritatively about uh, new directions we can go in trying to understand conflict and harm. So if you want more information about this upcoming event uh, or other upcoming events and podcasts of all our uh, past events, please go to, again to that website, which is cfe.ryerson.ca. Thank you very much for joining us today. Goodbye.